my name is Jackie Bachmeyer and I'm with Evolution Fitness and Wellness. I'm a member of the Sci Fair Chamber of Commerce. And today I came to this uh, network business development breakfast and listened to Rashid speak about conflict resolution in the workplace. And he did a fantastic job of associating conflict resolution in the workplace to really um, critical moments in our history where a calm head respect, dignity, and empathy went a long way in solving some of the great uh, conflict crisis in political history. Uh, I highly recommend listening to his presentation. He's a dynamic speaker, shows a lot of empathy and respect for those in the room that he's speaking to, and I just really walked away with an aha moment of how I can work with people on a day-to-day -day basis that maybe we don't see quite eye-to-eye, -eye, um, but found a new way that I can approach that so that maybe we can come to the table and just be a little bit more calm and collected about getting to the resolve of the problem. So, um, yeah, seek him out. Necessary Bridges, great book. And talk to Rashid because I think he could help you look at conflict in a completely different manner. This is what minor conflict looks like. <laughs> this is not going to stop in our lifetimes. But what starts here, sometimes it escalates to this. And nobody wants to be here. Something happens to us in this mode and almost uncontrollably we want to defeat we want to subjugate. We want to humiliate the other person. It's, it's the way we all are. And we don't want to be here. We don't want to be here. This is a depiction of conflict between countries. Point to any two neighboring countries and I'll give you a history of conflict. It's not going to end in our lifetimes. But what starts here sometimes escalates to this. And nobody, no citizen, no leaders, no children, no adults, nobody wants to be here. Today's talk then is about us being able to create in our minds to visualize a red line that separates minor conflict which is inevitable, mostly unavoidable, and to separate it from major conflict, that we will find a way of not getting there. Pandora, thank you so much for that kind introduction. SciFair Chamber of Commerce, thank you so much for inviting me to be here. I am standing in front of you grateful for this opportunity to make a contribution. Mindful that each and every person in this room has been and will be involved in conflict. And humbled by the certain knowledge that a strategy of respect and empathy will help us overcome conflict as and when we face it. Today's talk is about taking a look at how monumental leaders in history harnessed respect and empathy as a strategy. Not a philosophy or goodwill alone, as a strategy to manage and handle conflict. How did they prevent their citizens from crossing the red line, from converting their countries into rivers of blood? That's what we are going to look at today. In fact, if you can imagine it, they're going to be here and they are going to tell you what they did. And there is no reason why any of us in this room cannot be inspired and follow their example. We're going to use them as case studies, as competence models. The entire argument rests on a premise that a characteristic of major conflict is a complete absence of respect and empathy. When we are in major conflict, we don't respect each other and we cannot think or feel like the other. 
Therefore, as a corollary on the opposite side of the coin, it is feasible to think of empathy and respect as a strategy for achieving an imperfect peace. We're never going to have no minor conflict. But this is good enough to specifically think strategically. How can we harness empathy? How can we harness respect? Because we want an imperfect peace around us. This then is my entire presentation in one slide. This is the entire argument. Now, if some of you all present, it is always a good idea to have one slide which tells you the picture. Imagine you go to your boss and he says, sorry, we're out of time. Give us your most important slide. This is my most important slide. The entire argument is here. Today, I'm going to use a formula in public speaking, which has been around for thousands of years. There is a well-established, tried and tested formula. Tell a story to make a point. Why does this work? Because stories elicit emotion and the point provides education. Something I didn't know, I now know. And this combination of education and emotion is what makes a message memorable. You are able to better remember it because you have associated memories and associated education with the point. Put it differently, stories make us care about something. And a point makes us comprehend something. And it is this combination of comprehension and care that makes a message memorable. Tell a story to make a point memorable. That is the formula that storytellers have used, that speakers have used for thousands of years. And today I'm going to modify it just a bit. We will use a video which elicited a lot of emotion from me and made a point which I could not forget. So we will watch a video to reveal a point, to help us to build a strategy of respect and empathy for everyone. And as Pandora said, if you can imagine that I'm, I mean, I may be okay, but imagine that I'm so awesome that I can bring the world's great leaders into this room. Imagine that they are here. Imagination is more important than knowledge. If you imagine it, you'll be able to remember it. And if that's good enough for Albert Einstein, it's good enough for me. So with this setup, my task is clear. I am not so much a speaker, though I will be speaking. I am someone who has invited guests here. I'm going to moderate it. I'm going to listen to them. I'm going to hear what they say. I'm going to summarize it in a context that suits us in a chamber of commerce. And then I'm going to have what we call a discuss and debrief. And I want you to imagine. Now, I know you are all just awesome, but you've had or you do have or you will have an enemy. And if you can see that enemy, really see that enemy now, this presentation will serve you better. So if you have someone you dislike or an enemy, just visualize that person now. Any just saints one? out here? Just <laughs> <one>. <laughs> You're going to be transformed by the time this is done. All right. Our first case study is South Africa. February 1990, Nelson Mandela gets released from jail. February 10th, 1990. Some dates stand in history. Neil Armstrong walking on the moon. John F. Kennedy being assassinated, Pearl Harbor being bombed, 9-11. This day stands in that league, in the history of civil rights. And everything was set for this country to go up in flames. If you think we have it bad here, it was terrible there. And yet somehow, in four years, they went to democratic one-person, one-vote elections. This is a case study, the greatest example we know in history of conflict resolution. We're going to try to figure out what they did. The source I'm using is from a documentary called Miracle Rising. Go to YouTube. I encourage you to see the whole video. It is marvelous. We're going to use some clips from it. So when you see this, there's a video coming. Uh, we're going to now be introduced just thematically to what happened in South Africa. So our first video. Once upon a time, long, long ago, 
there was a country where people were separated by virtue of the color of their skin. South Africa, after 300 years, finally saying, you know, this is going to be a country where everyone counts. Why is the South African story a miracle? Our fight, our constitution, our democracy is definitely one to look at and to learn from. All colors of the rainbow moved out of each other's way to accommodate. To show how negativity can be transformed into positivity. I am proud to hold your hand for us to go forward. How did we avoid continuing to the point where we did not care whether we destroyed all life? So when, when I saw this, the question that jumped out at me, it really jumped out at me, the entire core of this message was, how did they, Avoid continuing to a point where they did not care anymore whether they butchered each other. How did they do that? And if you're involved in a conflict at work, that question translates to this one. How do you and I avoid continuing to a point where we really don't care what happens to our relationships? Key takeaway, ask yourself, at all times, how do I avoid crossing that line? To put it differently, how do we avoid crossing a line beyond which we don't care whether you are destroyed or not destroyed is of no concern to me. How do we avoid crossing that line? That's what this is about. And the answer, respect. Simple respect. Our story begins in 1941 when a very young Nelson Mandela walks into the office of Walter Susulu. This is one of history's famous pairings, you know, like Lennon McCartney and famous duos. He was the quiet man <laughs> behind the scenes, the strategist. And the minute Nelson Mandela walked in, he saw awesome leadership ability and he recruited him to the cause. And he says, we have a weapon that we will fight no matter what happens until we get equal rights. But he said, we have a weapon. No matter what happens, we will always insist on being respected. And the way we do that is by giving it first. Respect, simple respect, is the formula for not crossing a line beyond which you no longer care about others. So Mr. Nelson Mandela went and met Miss Oprah Winfrey. So I want you to hear it in his own words, the way he says it. So she asked him, what did you do? How did you manage to get those prison guards who basically hated you all? You were considered to be the world's worst terrorists. How did you get them to respect you? That was the question she asked. So if you can imagine that he's here and you're asking him that question, let's listen to what he said. You must fight the battle for dignity. Mm -hmm on the very first day you go to jail. Really? And uh, that's what we did. We put our foot down and insisted in being respected, even though we were prisoners. And we eventually succeeded in that. You, you you'd also said to me uh, one evening, you said, we made the brain dominate the blood. Our emotion said, mm -hmm. the white minority is an enemy. We must never talk to them. But our brain said, if you don't talk to this man, your country will go up in flames. And for many years to come, this country will be engulfed in rivers of blood. So we had to reconcile that conflict. And uh, our talking to the enemy was the result of the domination of the brain of our emotions. He makes the point well. So when you're in a conflict, what's the first thing you do? 
fight the battle for dignity, not just your own, everyone's, from day one. And insist on everyone being respected, including yourself. Insist on it. Let's go to our next movie. The person who asked that question, how did we avoid going to the point, his name is Mac Maharaj. He was a young political prisoner who came into Nelson Mandela's sphere in jail and he joined the movement. He's our next guest. He's going to tell us how they used it in jail to overcome the prejudices and the harshness of the prison guards. The stories from jail. Mac Maharaj is our guest. Let's listen to what he has to say. In a conflict, you have to respect your opponent, to react to them, not just as a group, but as individuals. Now, if I just saw them as a group and said enemy, I'm unable to go behind that screen. We put Mandela as our spokesman. The overall head of the prison service, General Stein, he began to converse with Mandela. And this is where Mandela pulled something that I have never ceased to be amazed with. In his firm but quiet voice, he said, General, you and I are on opposite sides of this war. One day, even when we have fought to the point where we have reduced our country to ashes, and one side emerges as victor and the other side as vanquished, you and I will have to meet, even over those ashes. The quality of that moment will depend on how you and I have treated each other today. That's something we need to think about. I have seldom been as empowered because I then understood what it is to uphold one's dignity in a way that compels the other side to respect you. What do you take away from this clip? Before you react, find it in you to find something to respect about your opponent. Look beyond the label. And today in our country, that label is Democrats and Republicans a lot. Look behind it, look above it and see the person that you are talking to. And this, I think, is the complete formula. It is your responsibility as a business owner, as a citizen, to uphold your dignity, but not in a way that is weak, because then you'll get run over. Uphold it in such a way that your enemy is compelled to respect you. That was Nelson Mandela, terrorist-in-chief against a minister-level person in jail. And yet that person left thinking, I must respect him. This is the great skill a society needs. This is a great skill in your company. If you can do this, 40 years after they meet you, your ex-employees will say, I have never been so empowered because I understand what it is to uphold your dignity in any circumstances in a way that compels your boss, your customers, your vendors to respect you. Let this sink in. This is, this is the answer to the question. Here it is in one slide. And the other side of it is empathy. We've spoken about respect. Let's divide empathy into three categories. Cognitive is I. I know what you're thinking. I can think the same thoughts as you. Emotional is, I know what you're feeling. And I can generate those same feelings in myself. So step one, step two. Concerned is, I know you're suffering and I am concerned to alle alleviate your suffering. These are variants of empathy. I'm certain there are much more, but we'll stay with these. And now we're going to look at probably a two-minute clip. The first part is Mac Maharaj in jail, but the second part is when they all came out and they started negotiating with each other to bring the peace. They're going to talk about what they did that made the negotiations successful. So these are stories from jail and from negotiations. And what was happening is the government forced their language on the entire nation. And that felt like a foreigner's language. So the entire country was in riots and in the flames. And it was, in a, it was a mess. 
he's talking about that time. And what Mandela went through brought out the best in him. His years in prison gave him the time to think, the time to read, the time to formulate. The regime tried to introduce Afrikaans as a medium of instruction in all African schools. We were forced to learn in a language that for us was an oppressor's language. The township exploded. While that was going on, Mandela raised the question, and he says, in this situation, in this war, it's going to be crucial to understand the enemy. You need to get into his head and think how he would think. We have to start learning to speak Afrikaans. Bloody hell. He insisted on understanding the other, that we could not solve our problem if we didn't speak the Afrikaans language, if we didn't read their literature, if we didn't understand who we were facing. The heart of the story is that South Africans who were at war with each other got together around a table peacefully. If you look your enemy in the eye, you'll never be able to look away again. That beautiful greeting in the Zulu language, Sabona, which means I see you. Meeting outside the mainstream, outside the formal realm, often helps. The best moments to get to know each other was not while you were actually discussing a subject but during the coffee breaks. People get to know each other as, as people, as humans, and therefore you start trusting the other person. That type of interaction led to people developing sort of some warmth between them as individuals, as merely as human beings. And they're able to talk more openly, to talk more of the record, and where you're able to dissect the root cause of what the problem is. So what did I take away from this here? First, learn the language of the enemy. And this, even if you're in engineering and it's sales or if it's marketing, learn how to think the way they think. Get into their heads because conflict frequently is just you're speaking the different, completely different languages and fighting for something you don't even know what it's about. When I do a longer one-hour version of this, I go into great detail in the Cuban Missile Crisis and then Vietnam. And these are classic examples where once the secretary was able to do it and once he wasn't. And he tells us in his own words. But here, get into your enemy's head. Before you react, what is he thinking? What is he thinking? You have to be calm to do this. You have to be focused. What is he thinking? What is she thinking? And then get together around a table peacefully, no matter what happens. This is, this is the tough bit. You know. Again, it just, if you, there's one political party and we only meet ourselves, that's not going to bring peace. You have to be willing to speak with your adversary. There is no conflict resolution if you don't make a commitment to doing that. This is, I found, extraordinary. I had a boss and sometimes things were not going well. He said, come with me for a car ride. By the time he was end of the car ride, everything was sorted out. He was very good at staking out people in informal situations. So getting to know each other in the coffee breaks is remarkably a formula for success. And most of us think that the problems of a nation are solved around a table. No, they are solved in the coffee breaks. And then we come together and just finalize what we agree on. And why does that happen? That was de Klerk, the president, saying, People develop warmth during informal interactions. And warmth can be expanded to mean respect and empathy right now. It fits perfectly into our strategy. So if you're finding difficulty getting along with someone, try to meet informally. And mostly you'll find if you discuss off the record, I don't want to know what happened. I don't want others to know. Just discuss off the record. That's what solves the problem. And I can tell you right now, in Washington, if this was going on much more, they would be finding much more solution. But there's so much pressure to put it on the press and to vilify the others that we do not set ourselves up for success. If you want to solve a problem, discuss it off the record first. You tell me something and I will not tell anyone else. It will not come out. What's bothering you? This is where problems are solved. 
And then this is that ability. Look past labels, look past everyone and be confident. I see you. I can see you. All right, we'll have a discussion debrief session. Everyone's got a partner? I've been asking everyone to give me feedback, and this is the section in which I get the most mixed feedback. Some people say interaction takes too long, and, but most people say the interaction was the best. I'm getting about 70-80% of people who like interaction, so I've pushed it quite a bit. And do feel free to discuss what you learned, even after this before you go, because it enhances your chance to remember it. You might understand it now, but you won't remember it at a key moment. But if you associate it with someone you discuss it with, you will remember it. And I'll follow up on Anita says, respect your husbands. <laughs> 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 All right, guys, I, I'm going to summarize quick now. <laughs> I'm going to summarize quick. Hmm? There is a red line. It is on you as a citizen to have a clear line beyond which I will not cross. Here it is. If you're in major conflict, respect and empathy is absent. Therefore, a strategy, a deliberate strategy is the way to go. Fight the battle of dignity from the very first day. From the very first day. Insist on everyone being respected. This was Nelson Mandela to Oprah Winfrey. Respect before reacting. Mac Maharaj from jail. In a conflict, you must respect your adversary. Look beyond the label. You all have all brought this up. So this is the summary. You all have summarized it once. Here we are again. Look at the person. Who is this person? What are they thinking? What are they feeling? And here's the, here's the answer. If you can do this, you will be well served in life. It doesn't matter whether you have fun, whether you use foul language, whatever it is. If it is done in this context, you will be successful. This is the formula. Learn the language of your enemies. So try to learn lots of languages. Not just English, but even technical languages, project management languages. The more you learn, the more you'll be able to get along. Get into their heads, get into their heads, figure out what they're thinking before reacting. Get around a table peacefully. How many of you are making a commitment right now, that person that you visualized, you're gonna get around a table peacefully? Come on, everyone put your hands up. <laughs> no one? I have to be more persuasive. No, you gotta do it, you gotta do it. You take the initiative and get together around the table peacefully. Because this is what it takes. To make peace, you have to talk to your enemies, not your friends. Maybe as citizens, we should insist on this with our politicians. Seriously. Just as a matter of citizen policy. Meeting outside the informal, it helps magnificently. Use the coffee breaks to get to know one another. People will develop warmth in informal interactions. To dissect the root of a problem, go off the record. See, just tell me, I will not tell another person in the world. Tell me what's going on. It's a bit risky because you're expected to reveal everything to your team. But this is the way to do it. And Saubona from Zulu. Be able to look at someone and say, I see you. We're going to go to our final video. It's called A Strategy of Peace. This is John F. Kennedy. It's a small segment of his talk that he gave after the Cuban Missile Crisis at the American University speech. It's called A Strategy of Peace. And actually, I borrowed the title from my talk also, A Strategy of Respect and Empathy. In 1962, in October, for 13 days, the world came to a crisis of which there has been no parallel. Hundreds of nuclear weapons were armed, aimed, Planes were flying over each other's territories. Submarines were loaded. And by and large, it is acknowledged that we had reached a point where the slightest miscalculation, the slightest miscommunication would have triggered a nuclear annihilation. And I think some of who have heard me talking about the Cuban Missile Crisis in the clubs, any time if someone was of that age, they come to me after the meeting and said, I remember exactly what was going on then. I remember. So the Cuban Missile Crisis is considered to be the 13 most dangerous days through which we have ever lived. So I want to I wanna read this out so you get it really carefully what I'm saying. In this video, we are going to see the President of the United States. This is not some theory for philosophers. A President of the United States do exactly what we have been discussing in this room. 
he harnessed the power of respect and empathy without using these words in his strategy of peace speech. After the Cuban Missile Crisis, John F. Kennedy and Nikita Khrushchev had gone to a place, an abyss, where no two human beings had ever gone before. There has been no incident like this. They both knew that they would have been the leaders most responsible for either a nuclear catastrophe or complete annihilation. Khrushchev used to tell his people, and Kennedy used to quote him, he said, if we have this kind of a nuclear catastrophe, those who survive will envy those who did not. They both knew that they had dodged a bullet. Somehow this planet survived by dumb luck, and somewhere inside them they said, enough. Enough, enough, enough. We cannot go on like this. Enough. So they both launched campaigns for peace. And they had their hawks to deal with and they had the usual politics to deal with. But Kennedy launched his campaign for peace with the speech in American University. June 10th, 1963 is considered to be the day that people began pulling back from the abyss. It is considered to be the turning point in the Cold War. The stepping back from a nuclear abyss. And history records this as acts of great political courage and great political grace. So let's listen to the way a president of the United States. That time, Soviets and the United States were mortal enemies. They could not stand each other and everything was a provocation. And yet John F. Kennedy, he encourages Americans to think about things from the Russians' point of view. It's a small segment of a very important speech. And second, let us re-examine re our attitude towards the Soviet Union. It is discouraging to think that their leaders may actually believe what their propagandists write. It is discouraging to read a recent authoritative Soviet text on military strategy and find on page after page wholly baseless and incredible claims. Yet it is sad to read these Soviet statements to realize the extent of the gulf between us. But it is also a warning a warning to the American people not to fall into the same trap as the Soviets, not to see only a distorted and desperate view of the other side, not to see conflict as inevitable, accommodation as impossible, and communication as nothing more than an exchange of threats. No government or social system is so evil that its people must be considered as lacking in virtue. As Americans, we find communism profoundly repugnant as a negation of personal freedom and dignity. But we can still hail the Russian people for their many achievements in science and space, in economic and industrial growth, in culture, in acts of courage. And no nation in the history of battle ever suffered more than the Soviet Union in the Second World War. At least 20 million lost their lives. Countless millions of homes and families were burned or sacked. A third of the nation's territory, including two-thirds of its industrial base, was turned into a wasteland, a loss equivalent to the destruction of this country east of Chicago. So let us not be blind to our differences, but let us also direct attention to our common interests and the means by which those differences can be resolved. And if we cannot end now our differences, at least we can help make the world safe for diversity. For in the final analysis, our most basic common link is that we all inhabit this small planet. We all breathe the same air. We all cherish our children's futures. And we are all mortal. Practically, it can be done, it has been done, it is on us to make sure that this happens everywhere. So here's the eternal question. You can't stop asking yourself, how do we avoid crossing the line where we stop caring what we do to one another? Here is an eternal answer. Respect, simple respect, and empathize with your enemy. Empathizing with your friend is easy. Empathize with your enemy is essential. Here is the formula. On you, uphold your dignity. 
in a way that compels all around you to respect you. Another line that jumped out from me was, hmm, no government or social system is so evil that its people must be considered as lacking in virtue. I mean, he nailed it. So if the governments are fighting, at least we, we cannot accuse the people of lacking virtue. It, it's, it's, the whole speech is a magnificent speech. You should make a commitment to watch it. And uh, Pandora's daughter is actually going to American University. All right. <laughs> uh, all right, so I'm going to close with four challenges. Why do we take on these challenges? Not because they are easy, but because they are essential. And I can give you many gifts and you can give me many gifts. I can motivate you, you can motivate me. I can inspire you, you can inspire me. But a greater gift I can give you is to expect the world from you and you expect the world. High expectations are gifts that we can give each other too. Now is the time to think of that enemy of yours. And now is the time to challenge yourself. One. We take on these challenges as a strategy because they are essential. Look at that person and see that person and say, I see you. Because you have high expectations of yourself, you are willing to take on this challenge. Respect your enemy. Have high expectations for yourself. Respect your enemy. Challenge yourself to respect your enemy. Challenge yourself to empathize with your enemy. Not because it is easy, but because it is essential. And finally, uphold your dignity in a way that compels all around you to respect you. be interactive, ask a lot of yourself, just keep going, but also he is so interesting, he has so many different topics that you will not be sorry you had to come and speak to.